These last few years have been tough. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and for human rights defenders, they've been particularly challenging. And so let me help put this in context. In 2016, the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission, Kazi Razul Hok, cited 2016 as the worst year of human rights abuses since the Second World War. 2016. And that statement was due largely in part to the extraordinary atrocities committed against the Rohingya in Myanmar. And since that time, Venezuela saw the worst human rights crisis in that nation's history, and the United States implemented a policy of forced family separation at the border. Since 2016, things haven't gotten better in many locations, and for a great myriad of people, they've gotten substantially worse. So this has led human rights defenders all over the world to ask, what are we doing wrong? With this many human rights defenders, this many human rights organizations, this many reports issued, this many policies implemented, how is this still happening? And to that, my colleagues at Just Labs proposed an idea. They said, yes, yes, this is still happening. And yes, in many ways, it feels like it's gotten worse. And yes, this represents an extraordinary opportunity. If there are this many human rights defenders, organizations, reports, and policies, and all of this is still happening, then human rights is in a desperate need of a redesign. A redesign that's been needed for some time, but now it's urgent. And they were right. We have to remember that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948. <laughs> that was some time ago. If we were using a computer whose operating system was from 1948, we would be having some trouble too. Yeah. So this brings us to the question, what does an advanced practice of human rights look like in today's day and age? Now, while this conversation was taking place, my organization, MindBridge, was being formed. And MindBridge's mission is to profoundly transform human rights through the integration of psychological and neurobiological science. Sounds pretty good, right? Sure, why not? But why? Right? Why? Why is psychology and neuroscience so important to human rights? Because this is what I would often see. I would often see, on one hand, Human rights defenders doing amazing work, often putting their lives on the line. And on the other, I would see psychologists and neuroscientists creating gorgeous research, and very rarely would the two meet. And this profoundly worried me. It worried me because of this. 40 to 90 percent of everything we do is unconscious. 40 to 90 percent. And that range largely depends on what the researchers were looking at at the time, whether it was heart rate, breathing patterns, the way in which we habitually cross our legs when we're seated, or the way in which we make snap judgments and jump to conclusions when we meet somebody who looks different from us. 40 to 90 percent. And for argument's sake, let's just go on the low end of that spectrum. Let's just say 50 percent, right? Sure. That's half of everything we do is unconscious. That means there is a vast realm of implicit, unconscious processes impacting key human rights concepts like dehumanization, empathy, and fear. And yet, very often, human rights defenders don't have access to all of this information. Of the hundreds, if not thousands, of articles that are published every year, very little of all of that makes its way into the field. And that means there are human rights defenders doing their work, and there are psychologists and neuroscientists doing theirs, and very rarely do the two fields meet. And that means that at times, their work misses one another, at times there's a mismatch, and sometimes that mispatch results in ironic 
if not horrific consequences. Mismatch, like what? Like what? How about fear? Let's talk about fear. Fear comes up a lot in the human rights world. And more recently, there's been quite a focus on the use of fear among government leaders and populations to garner support, justify abusive policies and practice, and to block necessary and meaningful reform. So fear. But fear is not the whole story. In fact, fear is often more useful when you're trying to stop someone from doing something. We might remember the 1-800-STOP-SMOKING campaigns that showed pictures of lungs or diseased lungs up on the screen. Or if you're my age, you might remember that this is your brain on drugs campaign, yeah? Right, showing pictures of the egg and the frying pan likening the effects of heroin on your brain. Both campaigns used fear-based imagery to try to stop a given kind of behavior. Much in the same way that populist leaders use fear-based imagery and fear-based rhetoric to try to stop things, support for things like immigration. So fear. But what if you want to motivate a population towards something? What if you want to move a population towards something that they didn't previously embrace or felt it socially undesirable to do so? How do you do that? Well, you might appeal to someone's desire to be seen as virtuous. And there's quite a sizable body of work that looks at, say, terrorism and the way in which terrorist sense of moral superiority is used to justify violent practice. So maybe you'll appeal to someone's sense of wanting to be seen as virtuous. Or maybe you'll appeal to their sense of reward. Friends, Reward is a powerful motivator, yeah? It's often said that two things ultimately drive human action, and that's things like human necessities, like food, sleep, avoidance of pain, and fear, and reward. And reward has been expertly co-opted by individuals and organizations committing human rights abuses, and yet, with all of that background and all of that research, very little of that makes its way into the public sphere. Instead, what we see are over four million headlines talking about fear and human rights abuses. Very little of that do we see reward in human rights abuses, except one. There was an important article in The Atlantic entitled, Cruelty is the Point. And that article reviewed the use of reward, both historically as well as in the present day, to bind people together and to promote and motivate atrocity after atrocity. Whether it was pictures or actual physical postcards in the 1930s of white men standing smiling next to the bodies of the black men they had just lynched, or whether today in social media, it's the use of imagery or actual cartoons to poke fun at families forcibly separated at the border. Cruelty and reward is indeed the point. So it's not just about fear. This is the mismatch. It's not just about fear. It's about fear, it's about reward, it's about disgust. It's about the myriad of psychological and neurobiological processes that ultimately drive behavior, and isn't that what we're talking about? As human rights defenders, are we ultimately trying to impact behavior? And if we are, then this realm of implicit unconscious processes matter. This brings us back to our original question. What does an advanced practice of human rights look like in today's day and age? And now, does psychology and neuroscience give us any clues as to what, my, what that might look like? Yeah, you bet it does. So far, we've talked about fear, we've talked about reward, and at some point, we need to have a talk about disgust. But for now, you might remember me talking about those four million headlines, right? Four million headlines about fear whether it was fear and populism, fear and polarization, fear and human rights abuses, over four million headlines over and over again, does that have an impact on us as viewers? Yeah, you bet it does. 
and it may not have been the impact the human rights defenders had hoped for. There was another important article published in January entitled, How Hate Speech Breeds Hate. And one of the concepts in that article and related research is this. An individual, an organization, publishes an article with a headline that reads, Refugees and Asylum Seekers are Criminals. Human rights organizations then move to counter that headline by saying, Refugees and Asylum Seekers are not criminals. But what does the brain see over and over again in that example? But refugees, asylum seekers, criminals over and over again. And it's worth stopping and pausing on something for a moment. Hate speech, not new. The fact that individuals, organizations, and at times governments leverage processes like fear and reward to manipulate populations, also not new. What's new is the sheer volume of headlines that we are exposed to each and every day, over four million headlines, and that one example alone, all at rapid repeat, largely to the advent of social media. So it should come as no surprise that after seeing refugees, asylum seekers, criminals, even by organizations trying to help, but just by virtue of seeing those three words together over and over again, that it starts to seep into our, our mind's eye. And in addition to the sheer repetition effect that's taking place, there's also a social component. There's a certain amount of social acceptability that comes after seeing four million headlines over and over again. It's as if for our brain, when we see four million headlines, we're seeing four million people engaged in a certain kind of behavior. Our brains are exceedingly social. We devote a tremendous amount of cognitive resources towards our social interactions in the world. You add that to social media, and it should also come as no surprise that refugees, asylum seekers, criminals, begins to take on a sense of normalization, a sense of social acceptability, where these concepts become ingrained in our beliefs and ultimately our behaviors. Okay, now that I've depressed everyone in the audience. Yes, yeah. All right, that was, that was the bad news. You made it, yes. The good news, and, and there is, there's good news here. The good news is that we can use these very same processes to turn the ship around. Research by cognitive scientists like Brandon Gausser out of the University of Albany and research in-house at Mindbridge point to our ability to use headlines and storytelling and narrative, not just to tell a different kind of story, but to promote a different kind of behavior. So rather than seeing hate speech breeding hate, we instead promote stories like hope, tolerance, and respect to create behavior that looks a lot like hope, tolerance, and respect. And this is an idea that has been spreading. Historically, after the Rwandan genocide, researchers used radio to promote peace building and healing between Hutu and Tutsis. More recently, radio becomes reality television where an organization in Kenya who wanted to mitigate gender bias used primetime reality television in order to do so. Viewers at home could then vote as to who they want to see be Kenya's next president. The title of the show, Ms. Kenya, and featured female candidates. Today, MindBridge and our partners at Hope Based Communications are designing a social media intervention where we're trying to mitigate anti-Rohingya bias in Bangladesh. Headlines and storytelling, not for headlines and storytelling's sake, but headlines and storytelling to change behavior. And I'd like us to really pause and, and think about this for a moment. I'm not asking us to promote headlines of hope because it's nice. Okay, it is, it's nice, we like hope, right? We like hope. But the reason I'm asking us to promote headlines related to hope is because it is a strategic approach for promoting human rights-based behavior. 
So rather than repeatedly seeing refugees, asylum seekers, criminals over and over again, we instead promote headlines that are core to human rights concepts like hope, tolerance, respect, dignity of every human being. I'm not asking us to stop monitoring. I'm not asking us to stop reporting on human rights abuses. I am asking us that of the four million headlines, we use 3.5 million to model the human rights we want to see happen in the world. Model human rights. And all of this has a fancy psych term. It's called episodic simulation. Episodic simulation refers to our brain's ability to simulate or imagine a given event or interaction. And research points to the idea that the greater detail to which that we can imagine something, the greater likelihood we are to actually engage in that behavior. So rather than seeing fear in four million headlines, we instead see headlines devoted to modeling human rights-based behavior to give our viewer an opportunity to simulate human rights-based behavior. And the greater detail to which that they can simulate that behavior, the greater likelihood they have to engaging in that behavior. Being able to imagine human rights is the first step to actively supporting human rights. And you don't have to be in a human rights organization in order to help out with all of this. Human rights organizations and media will continue to monitor and report on human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways that we can be involved and help counter things like hate speech is not to help spread it. Yes, we continue to witness. Yes, we continue to work to dismantle the systems of oppression that support things like hate speech. Yes. And we don't help to spread it online. Instead, we help to model and spread stories and examples of hope, tolerance, and the respect that we want our communities to have. Why? Because sometimes modeling what you don't want to see happen, the best way to do that is to model what you do. So what does an advanced practice of human rights look like in today's day and age? In some ways, an advanced practice brings us back to the core human rights concepts at its founding, hope, dignity, respect. What's new is the way in which psychology and neuroscience helps to uncover that approach, an approach where our understanding of the implicit unconscious processes serves to form that much needed redesign and help propel human rights into the future. Thank you.